Hello again. I'm Maurice Barrett and I've got another teaching in the parables and hard sayings of Jesus. We're up to study number 24 and it's actually the second part. The first part was the hard saying, many that are first shall be last and many that are last shall be first. That's a, a riddle, isn't it? How, how can the last be first? How can the first be last? But Jesus says, many that are first will be last, and many that are last will be first. Well, I can't go over that study. That's Numbers 24. This is the second part of it, and this is the parable that Jesus told to explain the, the first will be last and the last shall be first. So this is the answer, really, although I explained in the previous study. I've written four books on the parables. This is book number three, Obtaining the Kingdom, Parables of the Kingdom. But all the studies are in those books and they're available from Amazon as a paperback or Kindle download. And we've got a new shop, Shopify. You can get the app uh, and order all the books. I've called this pennies from heaven. It doesn't seem very religious, does it? Very spiritual. Pennies from heaven. I'm more used to sing. It's raining pennies from heaven. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that. Uh, I can't remember the tune. Uh, but anyway, let me read you where, where we're up to. Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16. I'll read the whole context, then we'll, we'll look at the parable. This parable is about the rewards of the kingdom. It's about stewardship. It's like the talents. You know, one man had five talents, he got another five. One had two and he got another two. One had one and buried it. So it's about stewardship for reigning with Christ. It's nothing to do with salvation. When you stand before Jesus at his judgment seat, uh, sorry, the great white throne when you stand before God, there's no rewards you get eternal life if your name's in the book you get eternal life but when you stand before the judgment seat of christ when he judges his church then there's rewards and punishments that's what the parable's about stewardship well done good and faithful you wicked and slothful servant out of darkness you're not in the kingdom so the first verse tells us that this parable is not about salvation it's not about eternal life it's about reigning with christ we're training for reigning, aren't we? Or we should be. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven, so it's not talking about salvation, it's talking about the kingdom that Jesus is bringing with him. Jesus will bring his kingdom with him, won't he, and set it up on this earth for a thousand years. So this is what it's like. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that's a householder which went out early in the morning to hire labourers into his vineyard. And when he'd agreed with the labourers for a penny a day, he sent them unto his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go also to the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I'll give you. So they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. And he said unto them, Why are you standing idle all day? And they said unto him, Because no man had hired us. And he said unto them, I will. Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that you shall receive. So when even was come, the lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the labourers and give them the hire, the wages, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more, but they likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the good man of the house saying, These have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. We've worked eleven hours, they've only, well, twelve hours, they've only worked one. And they answered and said unto them, Friend, I do you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a penny? 
Take that is thine, and go thy way. I'll give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with my own? It's my money, it's my vineyard. Can I do not, what, not do what I want? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many shall be called, but few chosen. All right, it's a simple study. I'm just going to through it. Uh, going to go through it. Let's see if we can learn something. Well, I think everyone will accept that the good man of the house is 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 Jesus. I think we accept that. His vineyard, throughout the Bible, God's people are the vineyard. In the Old Testament, we've got scriptures that prove that. I've proved it in other studies that the vineyard is is Israel, and also the church I'm the vine, and my father is the husbandman. So if Christ is the vine, and God is the husbandman, then then we're the branches of the vine. So we're now the vine, like Israel were the vine. So it's obviously talking about God's people, and God is the husbandman. So he's the one who sends the labourers into the vineyard. So I think we can accept that. And he agreed a wage for them, starting at the day, and he said, this is the wage, a penny for a day. Well, that doesn't sound much, does it? But a penny was a day's wage. It was a denarius, that's the Greek word, and it mean, denarius means of ten. And it was, uh, it was a silver coin. That's what they had for the day's wage. So I don't know what it is now, 100, 200, I, d- I don't know what people are. But it's a day's wage anyway, a fair day's wage. So the master went out various times of the day and he saw men idle. Don't forget this man is God. He sees people doing nothing, not working for him. And he said, why aren't you working? Well, no one's hired us. Hired us. Well, he said, I will. Go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you what is right. He made no agreement. This is interesting. He didn't make an agreement that said, I'll give you a penny. I'll give you half a penny. I'll give you half a day's wages. Whatever you work, I'll give you a proportion of a day's wage. If you work half a day, I'll give you half a day's wage. If you work a quarter of a day, I'll give you a quarter of a day's wage. That seems fair to us, doesn't it? Because we've got the Western Babylonian mindset. This is not how God thinks. It's how the world thinks. And sadly, much of the church So he didn't agree a price. He said, whatever's fair, I'll give you. So they were working on trust. They had no guarantee what they'd get. He said, I'll give you what's fair. So they expected half a day's work, half a day's wage. They trusted the man, so it was on trust. And he even employed men at the 11th hour. So they only worked one hour. He said, well, go and work in the vineyard. I'll give you what's fair. So they expected an hour's wages for a That's our thinking, isn't it? Fair days pay for a fair day's work. That's not how God works. That's men. Because we have our rights. We want equality. God's not into equality. He doesn't have rights. He does what he wants. He's God. Don't put God in a box and tell God to to work like your boss or like political correctness. God's not political correct. He's God. He does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and if he wants. So it's interesting, isn't it? They're working on trust. Well, at the end of the day, the last last in, first out. So the last one who worked, he said, come on, get your wages. And they got a day's wage. They'd only worked one hour. And they got a whole day's wage. They thought, whoa, this is one generous boss. This is benevolent. Of course, the boss is God. Is God not benevolent? Does God not want to bless people? So they they went away singing, we've got a day's wage and we only worked an hour. They would have worked a whole day, but nobody employed them. It wasn't because they were lazy and only worked an hour. Like some people do an eight-hour day and they, they really only work two hours. The rest are on the phone and chatting to other workers and they, they don't, not, don't work as they should do. This wasn't the case. They would have worked all day, but nobody employed them. So can you see how God thinks? 
He treated them the same as people who were employed all day. It wasn't their fault that nobody employed them. They were stood waiting on the corner for somebody to employment. And the man says, I'll have you and you and you. And these three didn't, weren't employed. It wasn't their fault. They were willing to graft and work. So God's good. He doesn't judge us on what we do. He judges us on the motive of the heart. They were willing to work hard all day. And God saw that, so he rewarded them as though they'd worked all day, even though they'd only worked an hour. Can you see how God thinks differently than us? We think that's not fair, but it's very fair to God's mentality. So those who'd worked all day, they were delighted that the men got a full day's wage for an hour. They thought, whoa, this is good. This is one benevolent boss. They get a full day's wage for an hour. What will we get of work? 12 hours. We'll get a real good bonus. So they, they were clapping their hands that God was, the, the boss was benevolent to the man who worked one hour. They thought, wow, what will we get? They get a full day's wage for an hour. Of course, when it went through, the ones who'd worked all day, they only got the day's wage. The penny same as the other man. And they were shocked. They were disappointed. They were angry. And yet they had agreed for a day's wage, so they got what they had agreed. Why are, they, why are they angry? It wasn't fair. Oh, poor little people. It's not fair. God's not fair. It's people who want to be fair and want God to be fair. Matthew 20. Verse 10, this is the part. But when the first came, they supposed they should have received more, but they likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the good man of house. This is believers who will criticise Jesus. When they come to get the rewards, they'll say, God, I've worked 40 years for you. I've been on the mission field. I've done this. I've sacrificed. I brought my children up. I've done that. And this person only had been saved two weeks and you've rewarded him. This is about the judgment seat of Christ. Christians will moan because they, they think like the world. They don't think that God wants to bless the righteous and the unrighteous. And God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. They can't think like God. So they think like the world. It, God's not politically correct. That's not fair, God. There'll be lots of moans at the judgment seat of Christ. This isn't the only one parable that says, Jesus said, many will say, but we've cast devils out in your name and we've done many wonderful works and why haven't we got a reward? And Jesus will say, depart from me. Your motive was wrong. Though I cast out devils and give my body to be burned and have all knowledge and don't have love, the motive was wrong. It's not what you do to get your reward. You can be a missionary for 30 years if it was ego that made you on the mission field and if it was ego that made you run your big church, there's no reward. Only what's done through love gets a reward. Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 3. Though I speak in tongues, though I give me body to be burned, though I do wonderful works, it counts for nothing if you don't have compassion. God doesn't look at what you do, he looks at why you do it. That's why he looked at these men. They were willing to work all day, so God judged them on that. Not how much they'd done, but what they were willing to do. Can you see? We look at the outward and, well, he's not done much. Yeah, but he was had arthritis, he'd have done a lot more if he couldn't. This person would have gone on the mission full, but they had an unsaved husband. God judges them on your desires of your heart, not what you do. We judge people and say, why aren't they in the mission field? Why aren't they done that? Because the husband's unsaved, because this, because that. But God looks at the heart, were you willing? Unless you're willing to forsake houses and land and children, and even your own life, you can't be a disciple. If you're willing... God judges you on your willingness, not on what you do. But we only see the results, so we judge person. This is a mighty man of God. They've done that. They've done nothing. They've just sat in church. You don't know the heart. Don't dare judge your brother. You're not God. You can't judge your brother. In fact, you can't even judge yourself. 
because you don't know the motives of your own heart. The heart's deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't even know my own heart. I have to say, God, search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Search my heart. That's what David said. You don't know it. If you think you know your heart, you're already deceived. Because the Bible says nobody knows their own heart. It's desperately wicked. And who can know it? I thank God I don't know my own heart. I've got to leave that to God, haven't I? I say, God, search me. Expose me. Show me what's in my heart. Maybe I'm covetous. Maybe I'm proud. Well, I know that. I'm still dealing with that, aren't you? The man who's not dealing with pride is dead. It's not real. We're all dealing with pride, aren't we? I'm getting carried away. So, back to the notes. So, these men were presumptuous in thinking that equality was one of God's principles. And Christians also believe this of God. They presumed that the master thought like they did. Those who work the longest should have the most money. Those who work the least should get the least. But Jesus said the first will be last and the last shall be first. Don't judge God on our thinking. You know, God's ways are not our ways. It's very hard for Christians in the West, in this prosperous, decadent society, with all the pressures to be politically correct and all the pressures to think and write. And it's very difficult to get out of that and think like God thinks. I don't think Christians understand God at all. They, they think God's morally correct and, and politically correct and fair. Isaiah 55, let me read you some scriptures. This is what God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. So God doesn't think like you. He doesn't think like the government. He doesn't think like your pastor. He doesn't think like me. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. Don't expect God to do things your way. Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. No, he didn't. He did it the devil's way. If you don't do it God's way, you do it your own way, and your own way is the devil's way. There's only two ways you either do it God's way or Satan's way. And my way is Satan's way because it's not God's. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, this is the, the difference between your thinking and God's thinking. Let it sink in, please. Let it, I'm saying it again. Let it sink in. As the heavens are higher than the earth, millions of miles higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. That's the difference, the magnitude. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Your thinking is a million miles away from God's thinking. And God's thinking is a million miles, a billion miles away from your thinking. So you better get to know God's thinking, haven't you? And you won't get it. Anywhere else except the Word of God. You need to read the Word of God for yourself. Don't listen to doctrines unless they agree with the Word of God. Challenge everything and say, does that fit the Word of God? Read the Word of God diligently and find out how God works and how it's completely different than us. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than... That's colossal, that's a sermon in that, isn't there? And Isaiah 58, verse 2. He's talking about Israel. Yet they seek me daily. Christians are seeking God. They seek me daily and delight to know my words as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. God's people, and he tells them off. It's about fasting. He says, they seek me daily, but they don't know my ordinances. They, they don't know me. They're worshipping around the golden calf. They're worshipping the real God, but in the wrong way, around the golden calf. How audacious for us to think that God thinks like us. How far have we come when we put God in a box to think like us. It's a universal problem. The Bible makes it clear how God thinks, you know. Christians fail to understand. 
Christians think democracy is good. And many use the system in the church. They are voting. Who do you think should be the next leader in the denomination? And they all vote, don't they? Who should be a deacon? And they all vote. That's democracy. Everyone has a say. God doesn't call committees. God doesn't run heaven on democracy. What do you think, angels? What do you think about Tracy? What should we do? He never asks angels for advice, does he? What about Jean? And let's have a vote on what we should do with Jean. Should we bless her, angels? Michael, Gabriel, come here. What should we do with Jean? Should we bless her or has she been naughty? Should we smack her bottom? What, what should we do? Do you think God has advice? He's God. We ask advice of God. He doesn't ask advice of us. He's God. God calls people. He called Moses. He didn't call Israel a nation. He called one man, Abram, and made a nation out of him. He called one man Moses, one man Daniel, one man Martin Luther, one man John Wesley. God calls men, not committees. We don't vote them in. God God sets in the church apostles, prophets. You can't vote them in and say, well, he'd make a good apostle, he'd make a good pastor. It said God sets in the church. God ordains them. We can't ordain apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. We can ordain elders and deacons because it tells us to. And we can pick them, godly men full of the Holy Ghost. But you can't choose those God sets in the church. And God calls people. Actually, democracy, for me, and I, can't, I haven't time to explain it, is the most demonic system because it, it lets people think that they have a say in running the government. Presidents aren't elected, they're selected. The powers that be, the powers that run the world governments, they, they select, do you know what they say? Huh, the president of America, it's far too important a position to leave to the mugs to leave to the goyim, to leave to the gorgeous, to leave to the common people. They're selected. They're not elected. I think every president is, is in the bloodline of the royal family, aren't they? Every president of America. It's to do with bloodlines. That's why they picked them. George Bush and Clinton, they're all related to, to our royalty, the British royalty, tracing right back to St. John. It's amazing. They're, they're Selected. It's too important, the people who run the world. Don't forget who's running the world. Satan. He's the god of this world. So it makes sense, doesn't it? Politicians aren't running the world. Satan's the god of this world. So he's in charge of all the politics. And every system is demonic. It's just another way of controlling people. Well, I know that 90% of Christians would think that equality is good. But the Bible doesn't support it. I'll tell you why. It's a whole sermon. Is God a God of love? That's his essential character. God is love. And if you love, then you're gentle, you're merciful. You're, but love embodies it all. You can't have love and equality. Think about it. You can't have love and equality because love discriminates. I chose my wife because I loved her, but I rejected all the other women. It's divisive love. It's selective. If I love every woman in the world, who do I love? I love no one. Love shows favour, doesn't it? How do you know I love my wife? I've shown her favour. I married her. I gave her children. I, t I treat her like a queen. So she'll treat me like a king, I hope. But I, I try, that's my endeavour to treat her and make her the best woman in the world so she'll make me the best man in the world. That's how it works. Because I love her. But it's discrimination. I'm not worried about you other women. Sorry. All the thousands of women who, who watch me, I'm not interested in you because I love my wife. I'm discriminating. I'm biased because that's love. There's no equality in love, can you see? It is... And, because God loves, if he loves everyone, if well, that's what Christians say, God loves everyone the same, doesn't he? No. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. That's what the Bible says. If he loves everyone the same, he loves no one, because how can he show he loves us unless he chooses us? And he chooses one and rejects another. Uh, we can't get round it, can we, love? 
So love and equality can't coexist. If I want to treat every woman equal, I don't love any of them, do I? Because I treat them all, I buy them all chocolate, so which one do I love? It's, I don't know if you can get your head around that, but you can't have equality in love, and God is a, a God of love. So he shows faith, he has his favourites. Read the Bible. God doesn't say, if you love me, then you were equal. He said, if you love me, obey me, keep my commandments. That's how we know we love God, because we keep his commandments. Even creation, the doctrine of creation is my favourite doctrine. For if I never had any Bible, I'd understand God because I, I look at creation. Does God make anything equal? Are two blades of grass the same? Are two fingerprints the same? Are two eyes the same? We're all, it's two snowflakes the same. There's billions of snowflakes and not one's the same. God never makes anything equal because he's not into equality. He makes everyone individual and he makes us individual. Thank God I'm not six foot. Thank God I'm not two foot. I'm happy how I am because I'm different than you. Because my wife chose me, not a six foot man. She probably wanted a six foot man, but she settled for me. And, and so, it, so I'm happy how I am. I've had children and I, I, I don't want to be anything. I want to be individual and so do you. Nobody wants to be a clone, do they? Can you see it's the devil that brings in equality because he wants us all clothed, all to be equal, all to have the same wage and all have the same rights and all dress the same and all be politically correct. This is what the one world governs about. government is about, to train us so we're all the same. That's communism. We all get the same wage and we all live in the same mundane house and we all eat the same food. That's the devil's job, to make us equal. Because when they're equal, you can control them. When you're individual, it's hard to control them, isn't it? Because you've got to deal with everyone. You can't deal with the mass because they're all robots or clones. You've got to deal individually. And God is fundamentally for individualism, inequality. God is fair according to God's standard. We can see from the parable, I'm not making God unfair, but God's fairness is different than ours. He sees the heart that, that men were willing to work all day. So he rewards them for the willingness to work all day. We're not God, so he, he works an hour, so he thinks we give him an hour's wage. Fair enough. But we're not God. So don't think God thinks like us, because he sees the motives, and he judges us on our motives and the heart. It said when we stand before God, the motives of our heart will be revealed. Not what you've done. Don't boast about what you've done. It's the heart that, that God... You can do the right thing with the wrong motive. And God says, I can't accept that. Wood, hay and stubble. You can do something and make a pig's ear of it. Make a right mess and fail. And God can reward you. Because he saw your heart, you wanted to do it. The fact you failed doesn't matter. God says, they didn't want you to do that. The man who did it and got it all right and is full of pride, how can pride get rewards? It's the heart. So I must come to an end. I suppose Romans 9 would be a good study. I, I can't go into it. That would take another hour. But I, I defy anyone to find where the scripture says that God loves us all the same. I can't find any scripture or that he treats us all the same. I know you're thinking if you're watching on Vimeo or YouTube, uh, God is no respecter of persons, Morris. Read the scripture. Every time it says God no respecter of persons, it's talking about when he's judging, not when he's favouring them. Every time it says, and God is no respecter of persons, in other words, he'll judge you the same as everyone because a judge is impartial. A judge can't favour his own. If I'm a judge and my son comes before me and he's murdered, I've got to say, the gallows, my son. I'll cry. 
but I'm a just judge. I, it's, it's got to pay the price. If my enemy comes before me and he's murdered, I say, oh, gallows for you, and I'm, I'm happy. But I've got to be impartial. It doesn't matter who comes before you. You can't, because that's the judge's in. God is impartial in judgment. He's no respecter of persons when he's judging. But in love, of course, he's a respecter of persons. Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? And that, that's just one scripture. I can bring dozens of scriptures to show that God shows love and favoritism. Well, I'll just read one verse from Romans 9. But Romans 9, it's wonderful. Because he said, who are you to question God? If God makes one vessel for honour and one vessel for dishonour out of the same lump. And he uses the potter. If I'm a potter, I get a lump of clay and I can make a beautiful vase out of it. And then I can make something that we're spitting in the pub from the same lump. Or a potter go under the bed to urinate it out of the same lump and put a vessel of honour or dishonour. Because I'm the potter and I can do what I want with the clay. And Paul says, is God not the potter and you are the clay? Why does the clay say, why have you made me this? Why have I a, a, a pole? We don't have poles to put under the bed now, but the old fogies that are watching like me, you'll know what I'm talking about. What, it's, why have you made me that? Why haven't you made me a vessel of honour? Because I'm the potter and you're the clay. It's none of your business. I do what I want. The potter makes what he wants. The clay doesn't tell him what to make. He doesn't. The clay doesn't say, well, I'm nice clay, you know. I'm malleable in your hands. I'm, 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 you know, put a bit of water on me and you'll make a wonderful, wonderful vase. The clay can't talk to the potter. He's dumb. For he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. I'll choose myself. I'll, I'll choose who I have mercy on. Amazing. Read Romans 9 when you go home. That's your homework if you're watching on Vimeo or YouTube. Read Romans 9. It, it's amazing. Paul argues the case. Well... It's to, to do with predestination. I, I, let me advertise a little booklet. I've started writing little booklets so that people can take them just for a, a couple of quid. Um, and I've called a series Back to Basics. And this is a, a, a book on predestination. I'm not preaching Calvinists. I'm not, I'm not preaching one saved, always saved. I don't believe that. But predestination is a very strong in doctrine in the Bible. So I explain it. Predestination is actually God's free will. Think about it. Predestination is God's choice, God's free will. And it's in the book. So the, uh, let's get back to the parable. I've had my little rant, haven't I? Let's get back to the parable. The owner of the vineyard, which is God, of course, Jesus, exposed the thinking. And he said, why should you make my kindness evil? I've decided to bless this man because I saw his heart. Why have you made me evil, not politically correct? Friend, I do know your harm. Did you, you agreed for a penny. Go your way. You've got what you came for. Take what's yours, go your way. I'll give unto the last, even as unto thee. I'll do what I want. I'm God. I'm the boss. Is it not lawful? Can I not do what I want with my own? It's my clay. I, I can fashion what I want with it. Is your eye evil because I'm good? I want to bless this man because I saw his heart. Are you making me a bad boss because I'm benevolent? And I want to bless him. You're making me evil. Do you know people make God evil because they criticise God? Well, you bless that person, God. They're, they're, they're running a Rolls Royce. Why haven't you blessed me? I'm in an old Ford and it's battered and it's failed its MOT. Why has that man got a nice car? You're saying God's evil because he's blessed that man and not you. Be careful. We criticise God more than we think, you know. When you complain and judge another man because God's blessing him, you're making God evil. Because what you're saying is, well, you blessed him, Lord. What about me? Well, what about you? Let God be God. You thank God for what you've got. You're still alive, aren't you? 
I thank God every day I get up. I've still got my faculties at my age and I've still got a wife who loves me and I've still got children that none of my children have died yet. So I'm a blessed man. Let God be God. It's difficult. But you never have to justify God. You know, people have talked to atheists and they say, oh, well, if God's a God of love, why are all the problems in the world? And I say to them, it's none of your business. That's what I say to it. It's none of your business. You don't believe in God, so why are you asking questions about God? You don't believe in him. I'd be stupid to answer, wouldn't I? They don't believe in God and they're asking about my God. It's my God. It's not your God. So it's none of your business. If you want to serve my God, I'll tell you all about him. But if you don't believe in him, why should I talk to you about nothing? I worship the God who is, not the God who's acceptable or the God I want. Well, Jesus never makes things easy, does he? Luke 14, 33, I think I've, I've said this, I'm coming to an end. And he says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That's, that's strong, isn't it? Unless you're willing to forsake everything, you can't be a disciple. It's the willingness that God looks at, not the action. You've got to be willing. God may not choose you. You may be willing to go on the mission field and God says, I don't want you to. But you were willing to go and risk your life on the mission field. And God sees that. Because God doesn't send you, it doesn't matter. He sees the heart. We'll be judged on our heart, not our actions. I can't say that too strongly. Well, the last verse of the parable, verse 16. So, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. For many are called, but few chosen. And I, I talk about that in the other studies, many call, few chosen. Well, how does the parable work for us today? Because that's a parable that happened 2,000 years ago. I tried to explain the principles. Well, if somebody lives a wicked life and they repent on the deathbed and God gives them eternal life, same as you have worked hard for God all your life, it's not fair. They've got the same reward. They've got eternal life. What about the thief on the cross? He was dying and he repented. And God gave him eternal life, same as you. That's not fair. I, I've struggled all my life to be holy. I've, I've, I've resisted this and I've resisted that and I've not done this and I've done this. And I've, I've tried to live a holy life all my life. He's murdered people. <laughs> and as he's dying, uh, sorry, he was a thief, sorry. Thieves don't murder. Well, some of them do. He was a thief. So he stole all his life. And with his last breath, he said, remember me when you come in your kingdom? And Jesus says, dead right, you're in? With his last breath. And he'd been a thief all his life. That's not fair. I've worked hard for God. I've sacrificed. I've, I've, I've known poverty. I've known hardship. I've known all sorts of... I've risked my life in the ministry over the going to dangerous countries and where terrorists are. And this man with his last breath, who'd been a, a stinker all his life, God says, you're in. And he, all he said was he didn't repent of his sins. He just says, remember me. Don't forget me when you come into your kingdom. I realize you're the son of God. You're not like us. You're not a thief. So will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He had, and he, Jesus says, you're in. This day you'll, you'll be with me in paradise. Can you see how God's not fair? That's not fair letting him in when he's done nothing. So, let me finish. I'll, I'll finish with Romans 11. There's, there's so many things I, I could say. And I've said things that are not in my notes anyway. But Romans 11, 33 to 36. God's ways are in the sea. 
If, if you only get one thing from this study, that God's ways are not our ways, there are a million miles as far as the heavens are from the earth. If you can only get that in your mind, that as you listen to the news and listen to the social media and the politicians and your doctor and your psychiatrist, if you've got one, and all the people you listen to, think about that. What they say is not God's thinking. What your lawyer said is not God's thinking. What your doctor says is not God's thinking. It may be good and it may give you the right medicine, but his thinking is not God's thinking. It's part of the world's system. So if you only get that, that God's ways are not our ways. And this is what Paul says. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is or is If they're unsearchable, you can't search his judgment. You'll never know. And his judgment and his ways are past finding out how can you know the ways of the lord his ways are past finding out just just trust god trust in your lord with all your heart we were saying it don't lead to your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him he'll direct you don't think for yourself acknowledge god in everything that happens the good the bad the ugly thank god when you're in prison and your feet and in chains and your back's bleeding like paul says sing praises when your house burns down, sing praises. When your husband leaves, you sing praises. In all things, give thanks. Well, that's what it says. In all things, not some, not the good things, give thanks. In the bad and stinky things, give thanks. For that's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Why? Because we're stupid. No, because we know that all things are working for our good to them that love God. It doesn't say all things are good. But it said all things are working for our good. So whatever calamity you go through, it's working for your good. An eternal weight of glory. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's sussed God out? I've got God. I've sussed God out. This is, this is what God does. Have you heard preachers say this is how God works? Poppycock. It may have worked that one day, but the next day he does something different. Have you ever, ever studied how he heals people? One day, he didn't touch them. He said, go your way, you're healed. Another time, he laid hands on them. Another time, he spit on the ground and made clay and put it on their eyes. A deaf and dumb man came, and he didn't say, dumb and deaf spirit, go. He said, you lunatic spirit. And another time, there was a lunatic throwing himself in the fire. And God says, you dumb and deaf spirit, to a man who was lunatic. See, there's no methods. God goes to the roots. Don't think you know how to pray for the sick. You need the mind of God, the Holy Ghost, to put the words in your mouth because you'll pray for one thing and it's not the root of the problem. Christians come for prayer and they say, oh, I've got a headache. Well, of course they have. They're stressed out. They're getting no sleep. They've had a row with the husband. The Holy Ghost should say, I'm not praying for you. Go and repent and make up with your husband and your headache will go. But we want the symptoms to go. God wants to deal with the roots. I must finish. Who's been God's counsellor? I've got a good idea, God. Why don't you bring a revival to Manchester? That's a wonderful idea, God. My city, it's a gay city. God, why don't... Surely that's a good idea, God. And God said, no, Morris, I want to bring judgment on that gay city. I'm praying for revival and God's mind is judgment. Lord, you should bring fire and brimstone on Manchester. It's a gay city. And God says, Morris, that's not my man. I want to save them. I've got compassion. I want to give them another chance. Who's known that? How can you give God advice? You know, we're praying. Most of our prayers are, are a shopping list telling God what to do. Save the cat and do this and anti Molly and bring revival here and do that. And save President Trump. We don't know what God wants, do we? It might be the Antichrist, so you're praying against God. You, you Pray, your will be done. That's the safest prayer. Your will be done in my family, in my work, in the country. Pray for peace. Pray for the things the Bible says. Who's been his counsellor? Who's given? Who's first given to God and it shall be recompensed to him? Who's give God a, a good idea? And God says, hey, Gabriel, do you hear what Morris said? Whoa, that's a good idea. Let's do that, Gabriel. Go and do it. That's a good idea that Morris said. Who's given to God and is, is rewarded us? You can't give God advice. Is that the last verse, Johnny? The last one? For of him and through him and to him are all things. 
to whom be glory forever and ever. Let God be God, eh? Father, please help us. I fall into the trap myself, Lord. I think I know how you work. But I don't. Because your ways are in the sea. Your ways are not ours. Help me, Lord, to have the mind of Christ so that I know what to do in every situation. Like it says, when you go to court, don't think what you'll say. The Holy Ghost will give you the words when you go. Help us to have that mentality, Lord, when we go for interviews, when we go to see difficult people, when we go to see our doctor, our solicitor. Help us not to have anything in our minds so the Holy Ghost can speak through us. Your will. Lord, it's a tremendous ask, but I'm asking it. Because we want to be like you. We want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful. Enter the joy of the Lord. Help us, Father. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. See you again for the next study. There's lots more. There's another 30 parables yet to go at. So God bless you.